Okay. Good morning. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the American Muslim Senior Society Ambassadors Health and Long-Term Training. Today's topic is the red flags for elder abuse, neglect and financial exploitation, part two. We couldn't let you go from the last training without an interactive session and scenario-based exercises. And it's also an important topic for UMS and our daily operation mission. I am Malak, AMS Program Specialist and Volunteer Ambassadors. First, I would like to go over quick Zoom housekeeping instructions to better facilitate this meeting. So at the beginning, why you are joining this training? As a frontline volunteer ambassadors, AMS will always make sure that their volunteers are prepared and well trained to serve the isolated members of the community and always update you with the, community, with the newest community resources and be there to answer your questions. Please note that all the audience is being muted to avoid any distractions or background noise. This training will take one hour of your time and this meeting is being recorded for future training purposes. As you all know, we are using Zoom online virtual communication platform. Please make sure your speakers or headset are turned on and your volume is turned up. If you are using a telephone device, please make sure to tap on the number that you see on green to be able to listen to the training. For the Q&A, Please submit any questions you have through Zoom, the chat, uh, through Zoom chat box. You will find the chat box and the bottom toolbar. It will look like that. Sometimes you can find it in the bottom. Sometimes it jumps into the, the top, top of your screen. Make sure to click on the chat button. Right after that, you will see a white box opening on your um, left, right side of your screen. Type your question where it says type your message here and don't forget to click send. Now, please join me in welcoming and thanking our speaker for today, Elder Safe Center Community Educator, Mrs. Tofa Kasdin. Mama Muna, please go ahead, unmute yourself, and the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, Tova. Good morning. It's so good to have you with us. Today, we're so honored to have you. Everyone, I would like to uh, give you a little background on Tova. Uh, Tova Kasdan is the director of Elder Safe Center, an award-winning elder abuse prevention program located at uh, Charles Smith Life Communities in Rockville, Maryland. Mrs. Kasdan's experience includes domestic violence prosecutor, Montgomery County, Maryland, Nonprofit manager and consultant to the World Bank Group's domestic abuse prevention program. Mrs. Kasten is a frequent trainer and conference speaker and has testified on legislation at the state, at the local, state, and national levels. Mrs. Kasten's memberships include Leadership Montgomery Corps Class of 2019. Board of Directors, Legal Resource Center on Violence Against Women, Steering Committee Maryland Healthcare Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and formerly a past president and board, of, and board of directors, Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence. Mrs. Kasdan received her BA with honors from Trinity College, Hartford, Connecticut, and her JD from University of Connecticut School of Law. So we, you, can, you can tell what, what precious person you are in front of you right now and what an honor it is to have you Tova to give us some more of your wonderful training. Tova uh, was also uh, one of our distinguished uh, faculty who trained our first uh, group of ambassadors and received one of our AMS distinguished award. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to present you to Tova. Here you go, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Mona and Malak. I really appreciate the warm welcome and it's so good to be with your group this morning. I'll have um, Malak put up the, the PowerPoint and then we can get started. 
while she's doing that, um, I think many of you will remember the training from last week with our community educator, Sydney Polinkas. And while we're getting the PowerPoint up, I'll just take a moment to review um, some of the material that I know that you understood from Sydney last week, just to give a little background. So when we do the interactive scenarios today, it will definitely be at your fingertips. I provided these slides to reiterate the forms of abuse. The most important things to remember that you might recall from Sydney is that there's many different forms of abuse. There's physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, financial abuse, and neglect. And unfortunately, and you may see this in your own experience in working with elders in your community, usually there's not just one form happening, there's what we call you know, a co-occurring forms of abuse happening at the same time. So you might alert yourself and see a red flag for one, and then as you go deeper into the situation, you notice that there might be one or more form of abuse happening. Who are the perpetrators you might recall from Sydney's presentation? Those are typically family members um, or intimate partners, spouses or dating partners, account for two thirds of the perpetrated cases, but a third is also focused on stranger scams, and we'll talk about that today as well. So that's just a brief recap from last week, and um, I'm not seeing the PowerPoint yet. Are you able to bring it up, Mala? Yeah, seniors. Yes, do you see it? No, I don't. Let me see. Maybe I need um, to. Mama Mona, can everybody I see, see it? it? I, I see it. Where? It says senior centers closed loss of friendship, exercise, nutrition, access to technology, mandatory reporters. Yeah, I, 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 I can't see it. Let me see. Wait, wait a minute. Maybe she needs to unshare her screen so you can share your screen. No, sure. I'm the one who is doing that. Okay, oh, give okay. One second. Give me one second. Let me start. I have my, I see the folks on the train. Ah, here we go. Okay. Perfect. I'm sorry. I thought it was there. That's quite all right. We're all getting the hang of this and I appreciate you helping me with this. Okay. So as we talked about, um, and Sydney mentioned last week, with the pandemic, we have a heightened situation in which seniors are at greater risk for elder abuse and neglect. Why is that? Um, we have centers of gathering that are closed, of course, for public health reasons. And as many of you might be accustomed to gathering in your places of worship, and that forms such a strong uh, coalescence of community, we're, we're missing that physical social contact right now. And that oftentimes will cause elder abuse to kind of go under the radar. So what we want to do in today's training is, notwithstanding the fact that we might not have opportunities to physically gather together, we still want to make sure we're staying socially connected, if not physically connected, to our community members. So we can do that, and I'm going to give you some tips today to show you how. So next screen, please. So um, we're going to skip past that because I know Cindy went over a lot of the social social isolation and this is for your edification um, so we'll keep going through that and get to the red flags please advance thank you okay so we have our definition of elder abuse as we talked about that it includes many forms of abuse committed by a family member or an intimate partner in any setting. So we really have to kind of keep our radar up when we look at the red flags. It's not just that it's happening in nursing homes, it's most often happening in private homes or in the community. And the real key to understanding this issue is understanding that this involves a relationship of trust. So even if an older adult is just meeting a new friend, or even if someone's trying to scam them, the secret to that happening is forming that relationship of trust quickly with the older adult. Next slide. So as we know, it's a big issue affecting 5 million individuals every year in the United States and yet only one in 24 cases are reported. So we have a big gap between the prevalence of the issue, what is actually happening to elders, and then what is actually being reported. So today's training is really to focus on how to increase reporting so that older adults are not left in unsafe situations. Next slide. 
So we care about this issue because it affects health and safety. Older adults are 300% times more at risk for ex experiencing health and wellness issues if they're experiencing elder abuse. Next slide. We went over that, we'll keep going. Okay, keep going. We'll go through those slides, you can advance and let's get to the red flags and then the scenarios. Okay, here we go. We'll stop here for a moment. So the main focus of today's training is to say, how can we identify when elders are being abused? And while it's certainly not, as I like to say, a color by number, that is, it's not a fill in the blank. You can't just say, oh, this is happening, therefore there's abuse. You have to take a moment to build the relationship with the older adult so that you can, in fact, understand more about the situation. However, there are some indicators that may trigger your concern that someone might be in trouble. Those might be injuries, that would be the most obvious, but that's not always present. We have poor hygiene, so is someone not able to either care for themselves or are another person who's supposed to be caring for them not doing their job and leaving them in an unclean environment? Changes in their personality. So maybe you had someone that was very social and always enjoyed talking with you on the phone when you called and now is, makes excuses, doesn't want to talk to you, seems much more of a loner. That should be a red flag. Certainly if someone seems depressed, has increased anxiety where maybe they didn't before, there's a lot of change in routine. So you might be saying to me, well, Tova, everyone's routine is different now. Well, that might be true, but if your community you know, has gatherings even via Zoom and you had a person who was very involved in that and now all of a sudden withdraws, that, that could be a change. Certainly low self-esteem, Hoarding is a big problem, and we're going to have a seminar on that in September, which we can send you that information. So older adults who are living in unsafe environments with clutter, uh, food that's spoiled, uh, unhygienic, you know, conditions, maybe there's many too many pets and they're, you know, defecating on the floor, that kind of thing. That is not considered a safe environment. So sometimes older adults are seen as, you know, a stereotype might be like, they're eccentric, they're quirky, this lady likes her 24 cats, but that's not a healthy situation. So we definitely want to intervene if that's the case. Um, certainly we have, um, if someone is confused about finances, so maybe, you know, they were able to handle their checkbook and their bank account, but now because of cognitive impairment, and it can be mild, but they might not be able to do that anymore. That should be a red flag that perhaps they need additional services, and it isn't best to leave them in a situation where someone could be exploiting them. So if you don't intervene, you're really leaving someone open for abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation. And again, an example of that might be unpaid bills around the home, stacks of bills, things not being paid on time. Those are some indicators. Next slide. So I like to start with case scenarios because you know it's a little bit boring to have someone talk at you and you say, well, wait a minute, what does this actually look like in real life? So what I'd like to do now is read the first case scenario with you and then please type any questions or comments you might have in the chat, and then we'll stop and go over that. So I'm gonna read this for you and then you have it on the slide as well. So the first case scenario is, you live next door to a man named Bert. Over the past year, Bert's health has declined. When you saw him, he looked unclean, had trouble walking, and once he forgot which house was his. His family recently hired a home health care aide to assist him. Since the aide was hired, Bert has looked much better, clean and well cared for. However, you rarely see him now. It seems like he never comes out of the house. He's never available when you call. Looks like the aide and her boyfriend have moved into Bert's house. They're always around and seem to be having parties in the backyard. You've checked in with Bert's daughter who lives out of state. You tell her about some of the things that you've seen. 
pardon me. His daughter responds, well, at least he's being well cared for. It's so hard to find good help, good cheap help. So let's take a moment to think about that. You're the neighbor, this is the situation. Let's see if we can identify a few red flags together that cause you concern about Bert's situation. So I'm gonna give you a moment to think about it. And then I'll look at the chat and see what you've come up with. Anyone have any ideas to share? What's one red flag that you see? Um, if you want to speak, please unmute yourself and go ahead and participate. Yeah, we can do it that way too. Yeah, share your idea. Just go ahead and unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum. This is Dora. The one thing that's uh, very noticeable to me is his uh, lack of access to the outside people that he's busy, cannot get to the phone, and is not having contact with others other than the caretaker and her boyfriend. Okay, excellent. So you've identified one of the key factors here, which is concern about social isolation, right? Where you were normally able to connect, now you're not. So that, that is of concern. So that, thank you for sharing that. Does anyone else have another area of concern that might be a red flag? I think uh, they're taking advantage of him financially and of his home. Okay, what, what complicates that? What complicates the concern that they might be taking advantage of him? On the flip side of taking advantage, does Bert seem better off or worse off physically to you now? Worse off, it doesn't make any sense to have also the boyfriend moving in, not just the caregiver, um, but in addition to the boyfriend. So they got a shelter, a place to, uh, to stay, that they get to benefit from that part. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a little unusual situation. Okay, so great. You're both identifying that perhaps the caregiver and the boyfriend are financially gaining advantage, right? That they're financially profiting from this situation, even if not in actual funds, in the ability to perhaps live for free. And there's some ambiguity here as to whether that's something that Bert actually wants or it kind of happened to him, right? What I think is the, the curveball here, and we see, we do a lot of training in faith communities and villages, and where people kind of get mixed up on this one is the fact that Bert actually looks better, right? Whereas before he seemed like unclean, now he seems clean and well cared for, right? See that first sentence in the second paragraph. Yeah. So you might say to yourself, well, and this is what the daughter's saying, but he, he seems physically like he's doing okay with them. So maybe I should kind of look the other way. But as you identified, that might not be ideal to do that. So what could happen if the daughter doesn't intervene? She says, it's so hard to find good cheap help, right? She doesn't really seem motivated to do anything. But you're the neighbor. What happens if you don't do anything, do you think? I think Mr. Burt will go into a deep depression and he will, um, you know, stay home more and isolate himself more. So he will, might be sick and no one is paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. Like right. So he might become further isolated. So that's a great point. And financially, we don't know this, but speculatively, we have concern here that the caregiver and her boyfriend might be encroaching upon his finances even further, right? So the danger in not doing anything is, of course, his health and psychological welfare could be compromised, but, but really importantly as well is his financial welfare might be compromised. And the reason I focus on that is because if he becomes economically destabilized, then and loses all his money to these folks, then he's gonna have very few options in terms of being able to not either age in place or to be able to have caregiving if he doesn't have the funds to pay for it. So I always say we have to care about this issue, not just from a moral and ethical perspective that we don't want elders being abused, but we have to care about it from a financial perspective because folks who are losing their assets become more reliant 
on others like government and there's not enough of that money to be able to assist everyone who gets exploited. So we have to care about this also financially. So great job on that scenario. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so reading this one, there's a woman named Betty in your faith community. Betty's in her late 80s. She lives alone, but has a son that lives nearby. You and Betty aren't very close, but she lives on your street and you often offer her rides. A few months ago, Betty was scammed by a stranger on the phone who sold her a COVID-19 testing kit. She lost $500. Since then, her son has been managing her finances. Betty doesn't see her bills or statements anymore since her son put it all online. She's very thankful that she has a son who's able to help her. In the past few months, Betty has stopped connecting to friends in her faith community. You notice Betty no longer has someone coming to take care of her lawn. It's gotten very overrun, which makes it hard for Betty to bring out her trash. You sign up to take Betty to the grocery store one week and notice that she barely buys anything. When you question it, she says it's all she needs. However, when you help her put her groceries away, you notice that her refrigerator and her cabinets are basically empty. So. There's a lot to unpack here. Would someone like to offer a red flag that they see that is of concern? Yes, I think their son is misusing her money and is not taking care of her needs with her own funds. Okay, so how did you draw that conclusion? Um, based on the neglect of the house, the, the lawn is not being taken care of, we don't know what other bills are not being paid. Okay. Uh, she's, she doesn't want anybody to know that's what's going on with her because it's her child, so she pretend like everything is okay, but when it's not, that's also sure. something to worry about. Or well, she may be threatened not to say anything to anybody, so she's scared for her safety. Right. So there's a lot of red flags here, right? So let's look at the sun first, which is what Dora brought up, and said, you know, she's not able to actually see what's being paid but the circumstantial evidence and the conclusion you're drawing is she doesn't have what she needs to live well, right? Her lawn's overrun, her cabinets are empty. She doesn't seem to be having a flow of income which would allow her to maintain her simple lifestyle. So that's a problem. Tell me, what else do you see in this scenario that is of concern? Isolation again, she's not coming to the community. Okay. Um, the church or whatever faith-based organization. Right, excellent. So she's not connecting to friends um, and, and that's a problem. When, when the uh, faith member drives her to the grocery store, she's also not necessarily saying what is going on when asked, right? You question and say, don't you need more groceries? And she's like, no, nope, I'm good, that's all I need. But then you see the cabinets are bare. What, what do you think? Should you take her answer at face, face value or, or what do you think of her answer? Why is she saying that? I think she's, as Dora said, she doesn't want to like talk about her son because he's the one who's taking care of her and he's not doing what he's supposed to do. Okay, excellent. There's a lot of shame associated with um, this type of elder abuse. So she might not want you to think that her son is, you know, not a good person, not doing what he's supposed to do. So she might be covering up for him. We see this all the time. So people aren't trying to be untruthful or difficult in not telling you what's happening. You'll rarely, if you ask someone, oh, are you being financially exploited by your son? <laughs> don't, don't ever ask the question that way. You're, you're not going to get that answer because it's, it's really laden with a lot of shame, guilt, and a lot of Folks who are being abused think that perhaps they raised their children wrong, um, which is completely not true. Any of us, I hope you know, you know, could be, um, this could happen to us. So it's not about what kind of person you are, and but there's a lot of guilt and shame and sometimes fear associated with that. She also might be being threatened, like you better not say anything. 
I think what's interesting about the scenario, what gave rise to the son is he had the opportunity to take control of Betty's finances when what happened? What happened first? When somebody scammed her? Yes, somebody scammed her. So if you're alert in terms of red flags right now with COVID, you should be really attuned to the fact that um, there are a lot of COVID scams going on and they like to target who they see as vulnerable. And sometimes older adults are seen that way, not because they're not smart and capable, but scammers can be very, very uh, savvy with the way they approach older adults. So think about it. If you are homebound primarily and you had the opportunity to get a testing kit, and maybe you thought you couldn't make it to the testing station in Montgomery County, you might, you might do this because you feel like you're really worried about getting COVID. Um, but of course we know that you don't pay $500 for a COVID uh, test. So what, what gave rise to the son taking control is actually a initial scam by a stranger. So I bring this up to let you know that just like there could be more than one type of abuse or neglect happening in any given situation, there could also be more than one perpetrator. That's a person who's committing the abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation. So don't just think, oh, that was a scam and now son's helping and so we should be glad that son's helping. It could be true that she experienced financial exploitation at the hands of a stranger and that the son might be up to no good now that he has control over finances. So please be aware in terms of red flags that it could be more than one person doing it to her at the same time or in close succession. Does anyone have any questions or further comments about this scenario? I have a question. Sure. I have a question. Um, where do they go to complain? Uh, do they go to your center? Do they go... Uh, how do they how, how do they report who do they report it to okay so excellent question and i'm actually going to talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides okay adult protective services would be where you would report um concern for abuse neglect or financial exploitation there is no wrong point of entry. If you called our center, um, we would want you to call APS because we are not the governmental investigative unit. We are a nonprofit that provides safe shelter. So the best point of entry is adult protective services. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the coming slides. Okay, thank you. So thank you for the question. So perfect, our next slide is, what can you do if you're concerned about someone? So, um, it's really important to check in and even in especially now during COVID when our normal social connections might be challenged, we want to make sure we're keeping in touch. So you are so well structured and, and connected um, with your faith community. So I'm sure you have lots of infrastructure in place, but even simply in, in my synagogue, our clergy just simply sends emails and calls every now and then to make sure all the families are doing okay. So simple, simple, simple. It doesn't have to be high tech. Just checking in, do you need anything? How are things going? Are you concerned about anything? Open-ended questions are really the best way to go about this. And if something seems not right, um, you know, you don't wanna harass someone about it, but you wanna say, I'm always here for you if you have any concerns, or can I give you some resources that might be helpful? And we'll talk about that in a little while. If someone needs help with getting groceries, yard work, even, you might not be in a position to do that physically because of your own health or, or compromised immune system, but it's important that they be connected either to a nonprofit or agency who can assist them. So we don't wanna let folks um, go into greater despair because of what's happening in the greater world. Um, so if you know a friend relied on, let's say someone from their faith community, your community to drive them once a week to the grocery store, and that's not possible right now, and they say to you, I'm okay, you know what? I don't need groceries every week. I'll just make do with what I have. Let's, let's think about that and try to offer up another solution, okay? Um, listen and believe, that's really critical here. I think so many times when folks are new to this issue and you want to be helpful, 
you might say to yourself, there's no way that son was exploiting her. He goes to our faith community. He's such a nice man. I can't believe that he would do that. Okay. So if we put our own judgments on a situation, we're not going to be the active listener that we need to be to help someone in distress. So you really need to ask um, questions, but also just quite simply listen and believe. Um, you don't want to say like, well, why didn't you leave? Or why are you letting him still have access to your bank account if you think he's exploiting you? You don't want to challenge someone. You want to offer your attention and say, I believe you. I'm here for you. If you need help with anything, if I can't do it, I'll help you find someone confidentially who can help you. Those are all the best ways to assist someone. Validate always talk in a safe place. So even if you have good intentions and you call an elder in your community and you start talking about how they're doing, I think the first question needs to be, is this a good time for you to talk? We're checking in with our community members. And if now's not a good time, when is? So maybe there's the son there now or the daughter, that's not a good time. But at three o'clock they're going out and that would be the best time. You're gonna get a completely different answer if you ask a question when someone is in the room who might be perpetrating this type of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. So rule number one, don't have the conversation unless it's safe to do that. I've been doing domestic violence work my entire career. The first question, even if I set up a time to talk with someone, is, is this still a good time for you to talk? That's the first question. If it's not, okay, when would be a good time? And then I call back. And then sharing resources is so important. Um, on our website, we've created, and I'm sure Sydney mentioned, a new community resource guide for Montgomery County. This is an excellent way to make sure that older adults in our networks are connected from everything to food security, mental health services. Those are all points of access that someone might be able to disclose abuse even if they don't disclose it to you. So again, in the scenarios we just went through, the food insecurity pops up to me with the woman with the empty pantry. Even if she's not ready to tell you what's going on, you might say, well, there are resources if you ever need, you know, in our community to assist you. So just give them choice. Next slide. <coughs> so starting the conversation is what we already talked about. Um, we don't want to put judgment on it. We don't want to make them feel bad. Um, even if you think you're being like supportive by saying, oh my gosh, your, your granddaughter sounds awful the way she's treating you. That's actually not a real helpful comment. You might be making them feel bad about a relationship and they might be really torn. One thing I've learned about abusive relationships is that the survivor might actually still care for, love, have feelings of loyalty to that person. So insulting the person who perpetrated abuse is actually counterproductive to helping them. What you wanna say is, I believe you, I'm here to help in any way I can. You know, please, um, may I call you again? So those are good comments. So um, you definitely, again, uh, don't wanna say words that imply that someone is doing something wrong. So you don't wanna say, well, how often is your son stealing money from you? Or how often does your daughter um, you know, assault you? Those are all kind of value-laden words. So you might just wanna say something instead. Um, are you afraid of anyone in your life? Tell me a little bit about that. What makes you concerned? You see the difference there? You're kind of opening up the conversation. Next slide. So there was a question about adult protective services. I'd really like to get back because that's really the big takeaway for today. If you identify red flags of abuse, what you want to do is you want to know what to do, which is calling adult protective services. Have any of you heard of child protective services? So if you're concerned that a child's being abused, neglected, um, well, Adult Protective Services is for adults or vulnerable adults over 18 who need assistance in the same way that children might on the other end of the spectrum. You should never feel concerned um, when you call. If you want, you can call anonymously. You don't have to give your name. And it's important though to know, and we'll go over the phone numbers at the end, 
But the purpose of adult protective services, and remember, they'll never know that you're the one who made the call. So in the scenario with Betty, if you're like, something's not right here, she doesn't have enough food and, you know, or the other scenario where the money's not being managed, you can say, I'm a friend of this person. I'd prefer not to give my name, but here are my concerns. The more detailed you can be, the better it is because they can't really investigate much if you're just like, something doesn't seem right. That's not a helpful comment. The most helpful comment is, I always take Betty to the store every week. She spends $100 on groceries every week. For the last five weeks, since the son has been managing her money, she doesn't have any money to spend. You see what I'm saying? That's much more detailed. They'll do an investigation. They might call or stop by in more concerning circumstances. They'll assess the individual's needs, and they'll help develop a service plan if needed to maintain the health and safety of the older adult. I think one of the myths of adult protective services is people think, oh, a government worker is going to come in and remove the older adult. That happens very rarely. In most cases, they're offering resources, or suppose there's not enough caregiving in there and more caregiving needs to be done. They might suggest that. And in certain situations, if the older adult can't pay for it, they might be able to offer more caregiving. So it's really a way to give older adults more assistance and resources. So think about it that way. But there are circumstances in which it's absolutely not unsafe. Pardon me. It's absolutely not safe for the person to continue living on their own. And in those extreme circumstances, they may have to remove the older adult. And that's when they might call our shelter to see if we can temporarily sh shelter them. But again, your name is never shared. It's never shared with the person or anyone else. Next slide. So who is an adult protective services client? As I mentioned, it's someone 18 years or older, but not just every older adult would be considered a client. They have to have a physical or intellectual or developmental disability that impairs their ability to independently make their own decisions for themselves. So for example, maybe there's a 19 year old who has Down syndrome and is being neglected. Or we have an older adult who is unable to manage their activities of daily living anymore, and the daughter goes off to work and leaves that older adult in bed all day, and that older adult can't manage. That's neglect. And so older adult protective services absolutely needs to be called then. So what's there's a lot of middle ground here, a lot of gray area where adult protective services can't necessarily intervene. And I'll give you those examples too. <clears throat> Suppose we have a couple, they're 70 years old, they've been married 30 years, and it's a domestically violent relationship, unfortunately. The husband has been physically, psychologically abusive to his wife, financially abusive, and she has no physical disabilities. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people choose not to leave. Again, we don't want to judge them, but that's a situation in which adult protective services can't, can't intervene. I'm not saying you shouldn't call because they might be able to offer resources or, or you know, call us and we might be able to offer domestic violence resources, but that's a situation where they would not be considered a client. And why is that? Because they're not vulnerable physically or mentally. So the reasons for staying are not um, because they can't physically or emotionally decide for themselves. They're making a decision to stay because um, of probably a lot of hard factors because leaving is hard. But that's not a situation where APS will get involved. Next slide. So you ask how to report in Montgomery County, the numbers at the top, 240-777-3000. So keep that number handy. That's on all of our brochures. I know uh, we've given you guys placemats, Mona, and we have brochures. If you ever need any additional materials, you can come to us, but that is a number you should have in your phone because you may need to use it. Again, mandatory reporters are people who must report. Those are people like police officers, first responders, social workers. But if you're a community volunteer like yourself, it doesn't mean you have to report, it means you can report. 
but I'm arguing that you should report because the situation is going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So have that number handy, be sure to use it. This slide talks about what are some of the information questions they might ask you when you call, um, the name and age of the vulnerable adult, the address if you know it, um, who's doing the abuse, if you know if the older adult has mental capacity, and you know a little bit about the cause of the abuse, who's responsible. If something you think is imminent, you should call 911. It's really important. Again, you might say, well, why would you call 911? It's not a fire, it's not you know, a gunshot. Well, remember our statistic that older adults are 300% more likely to die a premature death if they're left in an abusive or neglectful situation. I think that is an emergency. And to my point, there was a case not far from where I live, somewhat similar to the scenarios we talked about. It was the only lawn that was overgrown. You know, I would take a walk in the neighborhood. I never thought that much of it, although I did kind of note that the lawn was overgrown. A son was living with his mom. He was neglecting her. She had pressure ulcers and wounds that he was stuffing with newspaper and powder. And by the time he decided that his mom needed help and it was an emergency, she was taken to the hospital and she died. She never made it to our shelter. So these aren't just made up reasons why you need to care. It's important to care because you're saving a life. Next slide. So we talked a little bit about who can and who must report. As I said before, anyone can report anonymously, but listed below are the mandated reporters. That means they must report because of their professional license. And those are the folks like physicians, nurses, social workers, psychologists, nursing home administrators, police, first responders, any medical or mental health worker, and again, confidentiality of reporting source, they too can report confidentially if they choose to. So that applies. So those are the people who must report. But remember what I said, anyone can report, okay? So if I leave today after this webinar and I'm driving down the street and I see you know, a, a man hitting an older adult, I, I don't have a mandate to report that. I feel that I have an ethical obligation to report that, and so I would, but I'm not mandated to report that. I don't even know these people, okay? So it is nothing to, it's, I don't want the takeaway to be, well, I'm not one of those people, so I shouldn't report. The takeaway should be, if I'm not one of those people, I can and should report because I may be saving a life. So I'm gonna stop there for a moment and see if there's any questions before we move on. I know I've said a lot about APS and mandatory reporting. Any questions? We have, uh, Tova, we have uh, just a, uh, an example of uh, abuse. We have a situation, but she is not elder. She's not an older person. She is a, uh, a young woman uh, and uh, she has to leave her house with her ki uh, three kids. She just got a, a divorce from her husband because I understand he was incredibly abusive and she's petrified of, she doesn't speak English, she is on, on her own, doesn't know where to go. And the person who's helping her is frantically trying to find a shelter for her and her three kids mm -hmm. because she, they have no other recourse. So in this case, do we report that? I mean, we, I, how, how do we go about solving her problem? I mean, what- So that's a great question. And it sounds like it's a case of um, domestic violence, right? Yeah. Okay, so we have lots of resources. If she's in Montgomery County, you can call um, Abused Persons Program. The Abused Persons Program can provide, um, they're connected to the Crisis Center in Montgomery County. They can provide emergency shelter uh, to this woman and her children or connect her to resources for temporary housing. We have a wonderful family justice center here in Montgomery County. We're very lucky. And they also too could be helpful if she needs resources. Um, 
I'm not sure where she's from, what her ethnicity or language is, but there's also a lot of culturally responsive domestic violence programs. So if you, without telling me her identity, want to email me, I'm happy to share some additional resources for you. Thank you. You're always welcome to call me or email me, even if it's not an elder abuse. I have a lot of um, knowledge of programs in this area that work with younger domestic violence survivors and cultural and faith programs that can assist. Right. So please don't let language or culture be a barrier because there are a lot of really excellent organizations that can help. So okay. please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks so much. Sure. Other questions? Yes, I'm wondering, um, I didn't hear much, and forgive me if you did mention it and I didn't pick up on it, about uh, verbal abuse, which is more difficult to identify. Right, no, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, I did kind of a quick summary because I, uh, my colleague may have gone into it, but it's important to understand. A lot of people think that abuse is only physical, but as we know, some of the most damaging forms of abuse are verbal or emotional abuse. So if you're insulting someone, and in the context of elder abuse, what does that look like? That might look like saying to someone, let's say it's a daughter caring for her mom and leaving her neglected. She might say things like, well, you're lucky that anyone's caring for you at all. You're lucky I'm bringing by one meal a day. If I didn't do it, nobody would. You're ugly, you're um, a drain on our family. You know, So things like that. Um, we wanna to remember too that that is so hurtful. And so when family members or intimate partners are leveling verbal abuse at the elder, that is extremely damaging. And so when we bring someone into our shelter, we also bring in trauma-informed counseling because it's so critically important to understand that it's not your fault that the person who is insulting you and verbally abusing you is choosing those actions. Um, and its impact on you is very real. So we are very, very careful to make sure that the person has the mental health support they need to understand that they've done nothing wrong and no one deserves to be abused, even verbally. So thank you for asking that question. Um, oftentimes, and you know, my training is a former prosecutor, we focus much more on what we can see, right? The physical abuse. And even so, physical abuse doesn't always uh, warrant injuries. Uh, you can shove or spit or hurt someone without that. But the verbal abuse is not something unless it rises to the level of a threat or harassment that you can actually prosecute. But that doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, with this new legislative session, they just passed some legislation that's gonna come out about emotional and verbal abuse. Uh, and its impact and, and what laws can support that now. And that's a huge, huge progressive shift from kind of what I call old school domestic violence thinking, which is you need physical injury in order to be believed. So yes, we see, in fact, almost every one of our cases has verbal abuse or emotional abuse. We see a lot of gaslighting. So what that might look like with elder abuse is suppose someone's having some cognitive decline and that's natural, that happens to all of us after 50. Um, it doesn't happen all of a sudden, it's called MCI, mild cognitive decline. That's usually how it starts out. You might not remember so much. So an abusive family member or a scam artist might use that to their advantage and say, kind of like in our other scenario, well, you know what? you didn't do a good job in avoiding that scam, so <clears throat> you don't know what you're doing. You're clearly in no position to be managing your checkbook. I'm gonna do that. Or they might say things like, wait a minute. Um, no, you didn't write me a check. And they're like, wait, I thought I wrote you a check. No, you didn't, write me another one. So they kind of exploit the older adults' um, mental faculties to their own advantage. So that's often what it looks like. Other questions? Okay, let's move on. Um, we covered that, I believe, so we can. Okay, I'm looking at the time, but I think we have time for another case scenario. So let's look at this one to discuss, and then maybe we'll skip the fourth one if we don't have time. So the third scenario is your neighbors, Mary and Jim, are both 80 years old, and they've been married for 50 years and had what most people would consider a perfect marriage. 
Mary became the primary caretaker for Jim over a year ago after he suffered a stroke and started having difficulty walking and feeding himself. Mary frequently complains to you that she's overwhelmed and feels burnt out caring for her husband. One day when you were there, you observed Mary shouting at her husband and then she proceeded to slap his hand. She explained to you that this is the only thing she can do these days to calm him down and get him to listen. What are some of the red flags there? Those are physical, physical abuse. Oh, sorry, Mara, go ahead. Yeah, that's physical and verbal, both, to, you know, together. Right. So the shouting is the verbal, right? And then the physical is the slap on the hand. And, um, one of the biggest myths we confront is that caregivers are burnt out, which caregiving is incredibly hard and we, we all know that, but that cannot be an excuse or a justification to abuse someone. We can never fall down that rabbit hole, okay? Mary needs more assistance. Can we all agree on that? Mary cannot do this alone anymore. That doesn't mean Mary is a bad wife. That doesn't mean she's a bad person. And there's no judgment here, except that it is not okay that Mary should physically or verbally assault her husband, no matter what. So it is important for her to get additional services in there because that abuse may grow worse. And in any instance, that is not an okay way to treat your spouse. So what's important here is that if you witness this, that you would feel comfortable to reach out to Adult Protective Services. And, you know, you might, before you do that, say to Mary, it seems like uh, this is becoming really stressful for you, as it would for anyone. Can we talk about getting more caregiving services in here so that you can get a break? If she's unwilling to do that, then you may want to call Adult Protective Services. Where this can get kind of dicey is that she might say, well, look, we're on a fixed income. We can't afford it. Do you know how much caregivers are per hour? Now, again, financial constraints cannot be the reason that caregiving is not, you know, provided. So that's where adult protective services might be helpful. Um, in certain situations, they have sometimes long waiting lists, but in certain situations, they may be able to provide this um, through the government. But this is an unsafe situation and you can't let your feelings, your friendship with Mary, your vision of what you think a perfect marriage is and that this might just be a temporary hard time to cloud what is important here. So the best thing you can do is instead of focusing on all of the reasons not to call, if you just kind of go straight to the issue and say, is this okay for Jim to be treated this way? If your answer is no, then you need to do something. Would you want your father, your relative to be treated this way? No. Okay. So that's where things get a little confusing is some people will say to us, well, caregiving's hard. She just burn out. Um, you know, she's really nice. She, like they had a good marriage. So she's trying her best. This isn't, is this about Mary or is this about Jim, right? This is about Jim's being taken care of in a respectful and safe manner. And if he's not, then something needs to change. So I always say, not that we're not emotional beings, but we have to strip that away a little bit and cut to the heart of what is the best in, you know, what is the best environment for the well-being of Jim? And if you go from that vantage point, you're gonna be able to handle this much more easily than if you get caught up in these side issues that take you sideways instead of straight ahead. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yeah, I have one question. Yes. Uh, we, have, we had a situation where uh, we thought there was a, a, an issue of elder abuse mm -hmm. and the fear was if we report it, they might take him away and put him in a nursing home or something, you know, or, uh, and, and then take him away from the home environment. And uh, is, that, is that something, is this real uh, happening? I mean, would this be right. a scenario so, that to be considered? So remember, Mona, it's the rare case that someone's taken away, but if that's what's needed, 
then that's, we have our shelter in a nursing home. So this kind of idea that someone's kind of warehouse in a nursing home is kind of a really negative myth, it's scary. It's um, scary. right? There's some yeah. very good places where people can get the assistance that they need, even if it's temporary. No one is trying to warehouse someone. What we're trying to do is create a safety plan so that the older adult is not abused. So I'm glad you brought this up because sometimes people get stuck and they don't want to act in the best interest of the older adult because they fear that a worst case scenario, you know, like unintended yeah. consequence. If he has capacity, he can say what he wants. Okay. So it could be that a nursing home placement is not necessary, but finding another safe place to live or getting a protection order and getting the abuser out of the home could be another outcome. It doesn't always mean the older adult needs to leave. In fact, in domestic violence elder abuse practice, if they want a protection order, we can get the abuser out of the home. With well, our can, can I just ask you, uh, well, is there a way that we could uh, give the abuser like some kind of training or, or uh, mental health support or something so that, uh, they would they would get the, like like for Mary for example could she get some mental health support or uh, somebody who can help her as well because it seems like the two of them need help you know so I've been in the abuse field my whole career there are resources for abusers my particular nonprofit does not focus on that yeah. um, there are county resources so if it's domestic violence there's something called abuser intervention program you could call the AP program I gave you before uh, abuse persons program and find out about that so yes there are resources for abusers but it has been my overwhelmingly um, frequent experience that abusers especially if it's patterned abuse over many years of intimate partner violence they it's not so easy to change oh. okay so it's not just like you take a zoom and then you're good and you got this now it's very entrenched the power and control dynamics so again it's not about breaking up a family it's about protecting the older adult so your hesitancy to act because you're worried that something could happen is not helpful to protecting the older adult. What's helpful is to give the older adult, if they're able cognitively to make choices, to be involved in their safety planning with professionals who can assist them, okay? So your job as ambassadors is not to be the expert on the issue, but to connect to resources like Elder Safe, um, Family Justice Center, other resources that can assist in terms of victim advocacy and safety planning. I strongly suggest not doing that on your own, but in concert with experts who, who can do this. And if it's appropriate for abusers to be offered resources, of course they can. What I'm trying to say is, it's been my overwhelming experience that it's the rare abuser who changes their behavior because they don't think they're doing anything wrong. Mary's situation's a little different. Maybe that marriage wasn't abusive the whole time, but in most intimate partner violence situations, it's been going on a really long time, okay? Now, just because we had a case that was similar to this case here, the prosecutor was involved, but the spouse actually didn't get prosecuted. They were here to make sure that a care plan was put in place and that the spouse was getting additional caregiving resources so that this physical assault and verbal assault wasn't continuing. But that person was not prosecuted. So you can have government agencies involved, but that doesn't mean that the person would be prosecuted. And to your point, the, the victim ended up long-term in our community and is very happy here. Um, and uh, the other spouse is allowed to visit with supervision because that spouse got appropriate training resources and it was not patterned abuse. It was something that happened once, um, but it still was not acceptable. Now there's a big difference there, okay? But 
cases in which someone's been abused for many decades is not so easy to change. So very good question. Okay, I don't know if you uh, want me to wrap up. I know I'm over here. I can, we can, hey, we're gonna- please, please, I take your time and just yeah. do what you I'm need gonna, to know. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you about our shelter. Did Sydney go over this, Mona, last week, our shelter services? No, if Not you could please repeat it, that would be good. Please. Okay, sure. So our shelter is called Elder Safe, and we're co-located here at Charles E. Smith Life Communities. We have different uh, levels of care here. We have long-term care and independent living and assisted living. If someone comes to our shelter, they're placed in the appropriate living setting that matches their physical and cognitive needs. Next slide. So for example, sometimes people come to us, they might need some rehabilitation, some post-acute services. That's a picture um, of someone doing post-acute services. And they have all the wraparound medical, therapeutic, and mental health services here, or we bring in special trauma um, professionals to assist them. Next slide. That's our language accessible helpline. So you mentioned, and we certainly have worked with clients where English is not their primary language. We can definitely do that. We have a language helpline. We can call. If you call us and the, and the um, survivor doesn't speak English, we will patch in immediately a language helpline. If that person comes to our shelter, we will continue to use those types of resources. We also have our brochures and materials in nine other languages. And if it's not a language we have, we have a partnership with another nonprofit that can immediately translate or interpret for us. So it's not a barrier. In a case I'm remembering in particular, we worked with a nonprofit cultural program to also provide cultural resources. So these are some of our wraparound shelter services, medical, psychological, spiritual, um, social services. We're always looking, how can we safely discharge? Our shelter is about 30 to 90 days. In certain instances where someone needs long-term care, they can't make their own decisions because of cognition, their guardian may choose for them to live here. So we have people part of our elder safe family uh, for a long time. Others, they want to safely discharge and we help with community partners locate the best setting for them. Legal referrals are relevant if someone needs a protection order, if there's a criminal case involved. So we don't do the direct representation, but rather partner with our community partners to do that. And as I mentioned before, providing specialized trauma-informed therapy to our survivors if they choose. Everything is client-centered. Only the survivor decides what services they would like. Next slide. So that's open to any uh, questions you may have about any materials that we discussed or any of the services for ElderSafe. I'm very happy to answer questions now. Yeah, somebody is asking, is the shelters um, for free or if you have Medicaid or Medicare? <laughs> right, so great question. We don't charge for our temporary shelter services. Sometimes our folks don't have insurance. Um, they might be coming from the community. Sometimes they're coming from the hospital. It really depends. So if someone has insurance and it's safe, to build that insurance. So for example, we had a case of entrenched domestic violence over decades, where this survivor was coming to us for a planned rehabilitation after surgery in the hospital. She was coming here anyway. Um, in the hospital, the spouse was abusive and the hospital had to ban him. So we brought her, she was coming here anyway, we brought her into our program. She already had the insurance and so it, it made sense then to bill it because the abuser knew that she was here anyway. In some circumstances, it's not safe to bill or they don't have insurance. So the services would be free of charge during the temporary shelter stay. If someone wants to transition later on to Medicaid and stay on long-term care placement, then that's when it would be converted and our business office would work with the client or the guardian to effectuate the Medicaid uh, status so that they could then bill Medicaid after that. So very good question. Great, any oh. final notes? Any? Yes, go ahead, Sharif. Okay, uh, but, uh, this question is for you, um, and I'm not sure how it is in, in a Jewish community. I'm sure you're familiar with the part, but 
in the Muslim community, there is a, there's almost like a sense of uh, shame mm -hmm. if you're asking for help or if you refer a family member to a nursing home because there is almost like, a, a, like more of a sense of obligation that, um, that you have towards your loved one if that loved one is a parent or if it's a, a husband or if it's a wife that you feel like for the sake of the good time that you spend together, for the sake of, um, of having that family member, you are obligated um, um, to, to help them or continue helping them. But, but sometimes it backfire in a way that you're really struggling, like the, some of the scenarios that you're providing. Um, you, you cannot do it yourself. But right. you, you know, so that's, what do you, what do you think of this? And, and I'm not sure if it's applied to the right. Jewish community also or not, but that's what we have within the Muslim community. Right. No, I appreciate that. And I am sensitized to that issue. And certainly um, survivors I've worked with who are um, from the Asian ethnicity um, have explained that to me as well, that it would be considered, um, I'm thinking of the word in Hebrew as I'm saying it now. It's in Hebrew. It's like Shonda, like a shame. Like you would not bring shame by doing that. Um, again, I think while I am sensitized to that, I'd like to bring it back to always the question, which is what is in the best interest of the older adult? Okay. So while family and culture are very strong ties and should not be lightly dismissed, I'm not dismissing it. What I'm saying is if the older adult cannot live safely with family because the family is not capable of safely caring for them, doesn't have the resources to do that, um, I know it's easier said than done, but it should not be considered a failure or a shame to engage um, with secular services or other faith services to be able to provide that support. So it's not um, something that should be seen as a failure on the family's part, but rather a recognition that I think it's the ultimate form of respect and dignity is to age safely. And sometimes you can do that in place in your home. And sometimes for a variety of reasons, based on the skill level that's needed, it's not necessarily safe to do that. I think nursing homes have gotten a really bad rap for like, you'd be sending someone away. That's not certainly, I'm lucky enough to work at a very well-regarded, you know, long-term care here. That is not how it is. Family and staff are very much a part in support of the older adult's life. So it's not that you're like sent away and the family's not involved, but the family might not be able to give the skilled level of care that is needed. And then things might happen that are not helpful to the older adult's health and safety. So. I'd say in your community, the best way to break down those barriers is to talk about that and to openly say that there may be certain times by no fault of the family um, or in any disrespect to the religion or culture where it's not feasible. And so we have to embrace other ideas and resources when that's not possible. So I think it's really openly having that discussion. Uh, yeah, I'll just add something to that. Sure. In the sense that uh, not only is, it, is, it, is there a feeling of guilt or shame, but there is a feeling of concern. In the Jewish community, you have uh, physical places where your people can go. This is not the same for the Muslim community. And so many of us would be concerned as to the environment, the type of food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera in, a, in a general nursing home. Right. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and I will use mine as an example because I feel best positioned to talk about how things are here. While we are the Hebrew home of Greater Washington, our residents, which total over 1,100, are not all Jewish. In fact, we have a really diverse clientele of residents. We are a kosher facility, um, and any type of dietary needs are respected here and, and could be honored. Um, so 
it's important to recognize that even if it's affiliated, for example, with the Jewish faith, um, that's more of like a guiding principle, but any type of spiritual support here, we have spiritual support for many different religions here, not just a rabbi. We have interns from many different religions or uh, if a faith provider would like to come visit and it's safe to do that, they could do that. So this is not seen as a disconnection. It's quite the opposite. It's bringing together the resources that are important in the older adult's life and making sure that um, the older adult can access those resources. Now it looks a little different with COVID. Sometimes we do this with like telehealth or televisits with the computer, but if certainly it's encouraged. And if there is any, you know, the Hebrew home is not just for Jewish residents, it's for like the whole community. So all of your community members would be welcome in our facility. Yes, ma'am. I have one question here. Do you have the, uh, the statistic of the Muslim, uh, you know, population within the senior care home or anything like that in Montgomery County or even the state of Maryland as a whole? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have that statistic as to um, how many um, folks of the Muslim faith reside in long-term care. I'm not sure, you might be able to contact the state of Maryland for that. Um, they would have to self-identify in order for that statistic to be accurate. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for your feedback. We are past our time. Thank you, Mrs. Tova. Anybody has last comments, last questions? Go ahead and say it in less than a minute. Thank you very much, Tova, for this most excellent presentation. We loved it. It's been a pleasure, and we hope you come back to us again. We're going to set up something for us to uh, to meet one more time. This is This is so important for us because especially our ambassadors are continuously reaching out to isolated underserved seniors and and we we're stumbling into cases that sometimes we don't know how to respond to so thank you so much and please if we could come to you for support um, and your guidance that would be very very helpful Sure, my pleasure. Um, our helpline number is 301-816-5099. You can always call us, email us. And if you go to our website, which is smithlifecommunities.org, on the Elder Safe page, you can get a downloadable for the community resource guide. I also printed a lot, Mona, under a grant, and I'm happy to share with you. Please. So if you want some physical copies, we'll set up a time to give them to you. Thank you so okay? much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to have another